Okay. So in this lecture, I'd like to talk about heat engines and in particular, the Carnot engine. The reason we like the Carnot engine is that it represents the highest efficiency, highest efficiency engine we can possibly build. And again, it's a, it's a theoretical engine. It's not necessarily a, something that you can actually create. So let me uh, draw out how this works. We have a heat bath. A constant temperature, T2. Then here you've got your system. What's that called? A system is called an engine. And then here we have a second heat bath. And this is at a second temperature. And the uh, T2 is hotter than T1, OK? So we start out with the engine in its neutral state, or it's a default state. And it turns out that has to be in state uh, at a temperature T2, because the next step is to take that engine and we bring it up here, we put it in contact with that heat bath. And while the engine is in state, in a state uh, temperature T2, uh, heat is transferred from the heat bath to the engine uh, isothermally. And that heat we're going to quantify as energy uh, or heat amount Q2. OK. Next, we take the engine and we detach it from the heat bath. And while it's sitting alone, we take and we extract work from the engine. So we use that some of that heat that we put into the engine to do work. So this is work that's coming out of the engine and we're saying the engine is now in a state of uh, adiabatic transition. Right, so here we had an isothermal transformation, here we've got an adiabatic, and you can see again those previous lectures why we focused on the special cases of isothermal and adiabatic, uh, which are just special lines within our pressure volume space. But here, we got this work coming out. Uh, and in the process of doing this, the temperature goes from T2 to T1. OK, next step. Oh, here. We put the heat bath in contact with a second heat bath, a low temperature heat bath. And 
we remove any leftover heat that wasn't expended in work into that heat bath. And this is an iso isothermal transition. So the engine had to be a temperature T1 before we put it in contact. And finally, we again detach the uh, engine from the heat bath. And this time we do more work to the system in order to restore it to its original uh, default state. And that necessarily entails going from temperature one to temperature two. Okay, so this is the picture and you know, you know this is a theoretical picture because your intuition tells you that if you have an, you know, two pieces of metal that are uh, the same temperature and you touch them together, that heat doesn't transfer from one to the next. Uh, but in this case, we're allowing it because this is a non-spontaneous process. So we're essentially a, a allowing for heat to flow, or I should say we are causing heat to flow by you know, putting heat into the engine from the heat bath, right? We talked before about spontaneous and non-spontaneous processes. Well, this is not spontaneous. Uh, but nonetheless, we can follow it through the pressure volume uh, diagram. And we will do so uh, later on in this lecture. Okay, so this is the engine that we've defined. And this is the uh, called the Carnot cycle. So let's now talk about efficiency. Efficiency is defined as the work obtained divided by the heat input. So that is uh, work over Q2. Now, the entire cycle closed. right, in our pressure volume space, we start here, and we traced out this loop, right, so we know the area in that loop is the amount of work done, uh, but we know that the system itself doesn't have any uh, change in energy because the state of the system is defined by its position in this pressure volume temperature space. So if we're doing reversible work, and this is a series of reversible processes, and we have the same temperature pressure volume, then it has to uh, have uh, no change in energy. Right, so this is a uh, tells us this tells us then that the uh, heat that is put into the system minus the heat that goes out of the system must be equal to the total work that's done by the system. 
in the case of a reversible transition. Now, our intuition tells us that the amount of heat transferred is going to be related to the temperature, right? We, when you're thinking to yourself, oh, I've got a, you know, heat bath, it puts heat into the engine, the engine does work, and then residual heat gets dumped. You know that this Q1 has to be larger than Q2 if work is being done, right? And that tells us that we think that this Q is going to be proportional to the temperature. So our Q1 is going to be proportional to some T1, and Q2 is going to be proportional to some T2. And you know, let's let's just uh, call this. Uh, oops, uh, sorry, my laptop just fell over. Uh, a some coefficient a, right? Some constant proportionality. Well, that means that if we go back to our efficiency, we get efficiency is equal to W over Q2 is equal to Q2 minus Q1 over Q2. And that's gonna be T2 minus T1 over T2. So is this true? Well, I'm gonna show you uh, very soon that it is true, but there's consequences if this is. And the number one consequence is that the efficiency is going to, uh, well, two parts. One is that the efficiency is going to uh, scale with the change in temperature between the high and the low temperature reservoirs. And the second, you get 100% efficiency when T1 is equal to zero, which means that all of the energy has been transformed into work. And this tells us that there is such a thing as absolute zero. And uh, I've seen a couple small little uh, proofs from uh, uh, showing you know, how this Kelvin temperature scale uh, works out. Uh, but we don't really need that. What you need to know is that you know, it does it does exist. And it's a consequence of this engine. So let's let's step through this uh, pressure volume Carnot cycle and prove to ourselves that this is the efficiency. Okay. So let's say. I need to get some more colors so I can do this better, I think. Okay, I've got some more colors now. So let's uh, take our pressure volume space and we'll start out at point A and we will have Isothermal transition, pulling the temperature constant at T2, and that will take us to point B. So A to B, T equals T2 constant. Well, we know that means for an ideal gas that delta U is zero. And it's reversible. If 
which means that QAB is equal to WAB is equal to RT2 natural log of VB over VA is also equal to RT2 natural log of PA over PB. Okay, next. So, next we'll have a adi adiabatic transition. And this adiabatic transition will be taken to the point that T2 now becomes T1, or the temperature moves from T2 to T1. We'll call that point C. So B2C is adiabatic. And in adiabatic, by definition, QBC or Q is equal to zero. So the work is equal to minus du is equal to minus integral changing from temperature two to temperature one CV dt. Okay. Next, we will have a uh, second isothermal transition. And this is going to be at temperature T1. It's going to go from state C to state D. So C to D. Isothermal uh, at T1, constant temperature. DU equals zero again. So Q C to D is equal to W C to D is equal to R T1 natural log V D over V C is equal to R T2 natural log of V, uh, sorry, P uh, C over P D. Okay. And the last, we transition from D back to A. And this is adiabatic work. That's from T1 to T2. So Q, uh, DA is equal to zero. W DA is equal to minus DU is equal to minus so the integral going from T1 to T2 CV DT. Okay, those are our four paths. So that means our efficiency is W over Q2 is, and I'll write it here, R T2 natural log of V, V over V A minus the integral from T2 to T1 C V D T plus R T1 natural log of V D over V C minus the integral T1 to T2 C V D T. Okay, well, we can take and switch the order here on, on the second integral and make this be T2 to T1 and that changes the sign out front, which means that 
these two are going to cancel out, which means, whoops. Ah, sorry. Yeah, so that those cancel out. Sorry. And this is all over uh, Q2, uh, which is uh, RT natural log of V, B over V, A. Uh, this is a T2. Sorry. So that uh, Q2 is uh, this isothermal transition, right? That's the, uh, whoops. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, That is the uh, heat getting dumped from the hot bath into the engine. Okay. So, this is equal to T2 minus T1 over T2 if V D over V C is equal to V A over V B. Noting that the uh, natural log of V A over V B is equal to negative the natural log of V B over V A. Right? So if these ratios are equal, and I'll show that to you at the end of the lecture, uh, but right now I just want to move on and say, okay, if it's true, and it is, then we've proven that our uh, efficiency does have this relation for the Carnot cycle. Uh, what are the conclusions here? Well, we know that the heat transfer is going to be proportional to the temperature. We know that uh, there is a temperature scale in which the zero represents there being zero energy. Uh, we can take our expression now that Q2 minus Q1 over Q2 is equal to T2 minus T1 over T2 and get Q2 over Q2 minus Q1 over Q2 is equal to T2 over T2 minus T1 over T2, which gives us Q1 over T1 is equal to Q2 over T2, or Q2 over T2 minus Q1 over T1 is equal to zero, right? So this is the uh, heat that flows in and the heat that flows out, right? Which is where that sign comes from, right? But we know, and we, we talked about entropy, that's going to be our entropy. Uh, now, what else can we tell? Well, we know that any loop can be broken into a sum of Carnot cycles. And what I mean is that if I have, oops, terrible drawing, uh, PV. If I have a Carnot cycle like that, I could also express it as a sum of two cycles that uh, 
plus that, right? Because the area is the same. Well, it turns out if you start looking at this, you can take any shaped any shapes and oops, you can start breaking it into a set of Carnot cycles. And you know, zooming in here, right, within each of these. You can have more and more little Carnot cycles. But at the end of the day, this total loop can be broken into a series of these. So if we know that we have a reversible process, that reversible process can be broken into uh, Carnot cycles. And the kind of uh, end point of that Carnot cycle is, is the fact that we can express that is the sum of Q over T for each, each uh, Carnot cycle where we're putting heat in and out of the engine. And we also know that those represent our entropies. So for any cycle, well, for any reversible cycle, For any reversible cycle, we can get a sum of Q over T equal to zero. And if we take this and we've got some infinite number of cycles, because we, we break it into the infinitesimal limit, this then becomes uh, an integral over uh, the area around all of these uh, infinitesimal loops. And this gives us our expression for that entropy. So ds is equal to del q over t is equal to q. In the case of a reversible process, this is what we have. Now, I want to point out here that uh, this is, if reversible, if irreversible, then you're going to have a uh, sum that's going to be larger, and you get d s irreversible. And we know from our own intuition that this engine that we proposed is, well, it's a theoretical engine, right? Because if we want heat to spontaneously move from the heat bath into the engine, we need to have a temperature gradient. And if you want the excess heat to flow from the engine into the waste heat heat bath, again, we have to have a temperature gradient. And we know that extracting work uh, in an adiabatic fashion like this, it, it doesn't it doesn't work. So we do expect uh, irreversibility, and that's going to be a large part of the the rest of this class. Okay, so what else can we tell here? Well, the entropy is going to tell us the maximum work that can be done during a transition. And we've already seen a little bit of this, right? Whoops. Ah. OK. So
the change in entropy of our system is going to be the amount of heat that flows into it plus the irreversible uh, entropy due to degraded work. Right, you can think of that as you know the, the friction in the system. Well, a change in energy in the system is equal to Q minus dW, which means dQ is equal to du cis plus del W. So we can take that and put it in for Q and get d cis is equal to du cis plus del W over T plus D irreversible. So DW or del W is equal to T D cis minus DU cis minus T D irreversible. So this when we set this term to zero, this is defining our maximum work. So now I'm going to kind of come in here to the uh, well, I guess what you might call the punchline of this, combining the first and second laws. Or maybe the, the right way to put it is, is uh, where we're going from here, right? So from the first law, we have du is equal to del q minus del w. And we have for a reversible process, Yes is equal to del Q over T, meaning that del Q is equal to T dS. And we have our work, del W is equal to P dV plus dot, 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 dot. All other things not heat which means that du is equal to T dS minus P dV. And this means that the energy is a function of the entropy and the volume. And it means that we can write the total differential du is equal to du by ds dv uh, v ds plus du by dv s dv. And this is our temperature, and this is our pressure. And I say that's the punchline. And as a bit of a precursor, it's worth pointing out that we can write u as a function of s. We can also transform coordinates, and we can write s as a function of u and v. If we wanted to, we could then have the differential S is equal to ds by du v du 
plus partial of s with respect to v u dv. Oops. And because of these relationships, that means that we can have ds is equal to 1 over t du plus p over t dv. So we can perform coordinate transformations between state functions. And since we've come to this point in the course, uh, I'd like to you know, make a kind of a more formal statement of the first and the second law. So the first law of thermodynamics is really a statement that the change of energy of a system Uh, when transforming states is equal to the amount of energy it receives. from the environment. Regardless the form of the energy. Right? So this is where our du is equal to q minus del Q, del W, that's where this came from, right? We're just saying that heat and work can be treated on equal footing in terms of their capacity to add or subtract energy from the system. Okay. Second law. The second law is two part. First, there is an entropy defined ds is equal to del q reversible divided by t. So this as this entropy is defined as the heat that flows into the system in a reversible fashion. And this is a state function. And the second part is that the entropy of a system let's call it a uh, closed adiabatic system never decreases but can increase when 
an ir irreversible process occurs. And this is, I think, a, a fairly fair way to state the first and second laws. So now let's get to the derivation, All right? So we're gonna derive, we are going to derive, um, ba -dum, ba -dum, here we are. We're gonna prove that VD over VC is equal to VA over VB. And this derivation is not really essential, but it's kind of neat to see how you would go about handling uh, one of these uh, closed loops, okay? So I've got P and I've got V. I start at A, transform to B isothermally, transform to C adiabatically, transform to D isothermally, and transform to A isothermally. And you know we, we have this in the, in the previous part of the uh, presentation. So let's begin. And we're going to be begin and say, OK, we're in some default state of pressure A, volume A, and temperature A. And temperature A, we know, is defined as temperature 2. OK. From A to B, that is oops, ah, isothermal. meaning it's being held at T2. Okay, well, we don't really have a definition of what's happening, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna carry with us a delta P. So we'll say PB is equal to PA minus delta P1. And we're just going to define Delta P1 always larger than zero. That's just going to be the way we're dealing with it and how we deal with the negative signs. Ah, okay. What that means is that means that VB is equal to NRT2 over PA minus delta P1 because it's an ideal gas, and Tb is equal to T2. Okay, next. Bc, which is adiabatic. And we know that it's adiabatic and it moves T1 to T2. So what do we know about this? Well, we know that if we go to our textbook and we look in section 2.7, or that's the section from the uh, third edition, we have this expression. gamma minus one. Okay, what that means is it means 
that we can write by combining uh, this side and that side of the equation uh, that VC is equal to VB over TC over TB raised to the one over one minus gamma. And I'm just going to take that term on the bottom and I'm just going to call this B, B over Z. Just as a shortcut. Okay, I can also write from this expression that PC is equal to P, B, 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 gamma over B, C, gamma, right? This was our uh, uh, P1, V1, gamma is equal to P2, V2, gamma equals constant. Okay, so that means that coming back up here, I have PC is equal to P, B, 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 gamma over B, C, gamma. I have V, C is equal to B, B over Z. And I have T, C is equal to T1. OK. Now, continuing, I have the transition C to D, which is isothermal. At temperature T1. And again, we know the pressure changes, but we don't know how much it changes. So we're going to say that the pressure at D is equal to PC plus delta P2. And we're going to define delta P2 is larger than zero. Again, that's just the way we're going to, to carry these through. And you'll, you'll see they, they go away at the end, which means VD is equal to NRT1 over PC plus delta P2. TD is equal to T1. OK. And last, we have to go back to a, and I'm going to draw this here. This is D A adiabatic. And it gives us uh, T1 to T2, right? We know the beginning and the ending temperatures. So, Let me expand on this a little bit, or, or let me say uh, reuse this. We have uh, VA is equal to, sorry, is equal to the D over T A over T D to the one over one minus gamma. But whoops, but we also know that T C over T B, which we have up here, is equal to T one over T. Two is equal to T D over T A, right? So these two are inverse each other, which means that we can write V A 
is equal to VD over Z to the minus one. So we have uh, the A is equal to the D over Z to the minus one. That means we can write P A is equal to P D V D gamma over V A gamma and T A is equal to T two. Great. So we get to the derivation here, or the, the final step. But what I think is important that you see is that in writing this out, we know we have a closed loop. So we know that these two have to be equal to each other. And that means that we can pretty much solve through this entire system. If, if we define one of our delta P1, the second delta P2 is forced. We really have one degree of freedom in this. And that degree of freedom is uh, delta P1. And we're not going to do that here. I just want to point out that if you're working with these type of closed systems, this is what you can do. So next step. Well, the derivation is to prove that VD over VC is equal to VA over VB. So we can test that. NRT1 over PC plus delta P2 over VB over Z is equal to, all right, coming from the other side, VA over VB is VD over Z inverse, NRT2 over PA minus delta P1. Okay, so if this is true, then we can write NRT1 over PC plus delta P2 times NRT2 over PA minus delta P1 is equal to VD over Z inverse VBZ, great, which means that they're going to cancel each other out. And we get NRT1 substituting in here for, for uh, uh, BD and BB, uh, BB and uh, BD. We get NRT1 over PC plus delta P2, NRT2 over PA minus delta P1. True. So we've just proven that those are true, which then necessitates that our derived efficiency is also true.